all this is dr mobin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so i have about three or four interesting news a couple of studies one about long covid one about the vaccine injury and then a couple of other news as well so let's start and happy friday uh, this is drbean.com in the description of this video there is a link that gives you access to everything in drbean.com for 67 dollars only and as you know that we have actually moved to the courses structure and so this is just like last few days when you can get it for 67 after that these prices would be different we would probably just leave it 67 for this week then next week we'll go to 97 then about a week later we'll just move towards these uh, uh, these prices maybe we'll keep it hybrid for some more time till people can transition to this one. Also, if you go to our library page, members.drbean.com library, we just introduced 3D anatomy structures. We have actually just finished our first anatomy book. And so now the 3D anatomy with those, the descriptions in the book is on as well. And then there are lots of other videos too. So take advantage of this. The link is in the description of this video. Now with that, let's start with our, um, news is <laughs> news which it, which itself is plural so here is the first one and i'm sure that you have all heard of this one so johnson and johnson or jansen covid vaccine authorization has been revoked in the us and the re revocation is because Jans johnson and johnson has requested fda that our current supply has expired and we are not making any more so FDA has revoked the authorization. So this is that note, June 1, 2023. Dear Miss Walla Walker, this letter is in response to the request from Janssen Biotech Inc. received on May 22 that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration withdraw the EUA for the Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. So you can read the rest. The link is in the description. But what is worrying me is that anyone who is looking for the freedom of information uh, uh, act and the documents through that or anybody who wants to uh, claim any uh, vaccine injuries or just need to have more information they probably will have hard time getting that information because officially the vaccine and its data is not here anymore and the eu is gone so i hope i'm wrong but that is the concern i have it is actually good that this uh, this EUA is taken away because this vaccine actually did not prove very, very good. Okay, so then the next news. This I really think that everyone, long COVID vaccine injury, doesn't matter. But this two, two supplement, two, not supplements, um, one supplement and one drug should be something that you should, um, if I may say should, <laughs> look into. One is the solodexide, and I think this is a prescription drug, and the other one is taurine. So taurine, I believe, is uh, available from compounding pharmacy as well, and it is oral, orally available, injectably uh, for IV, I am available as well. Taurine, I'll do the study next week, has really shown very good effect. Similarly, solodexide has shown very good effect. So this is a study in which what they did was they took patients who had post-COVID endothelial dysfunction. And how did they prove or, or assess the dysfunction is that they did the... Uh, let me find out where it is. Post-restrictive hyperemic test so let me find it okay it will come so anyways what they did was uh, you restrict the blood supply to a tissue for example just like the uh, blood pressure cuff you put the cuff on the on the arm you occlude the blood supply for about few minutes of course you don't occlude it 100 percent you just restrict it what that does is that causes the tissues to have less nutrition and, and less oxygen, which then causes 
the tissues to have an accumulation of waste products and lactic acid. When the blood supply is restored, then there is a reactive hyperemia. Hyperemia means redness. Reactive hyperemia is that because there is waste product and because there is lactic acid present in the tissue, it's the, the, the waste is piling up in the tissue, that causes irritation of the tissue and the result is blood vessels become dilated to bring in a lot of blood to clear out all the debris. In physiology, this is called law of compensation, that if you deprive a tissue of nutrition and oxygen, and if the tissue doesn't die, then when you restore the blood supply, it will try to pull extra blood so that it can compensate for all the time it was not given enough blood. And so once again, the question can be, how does it know how much time? It depends upon how much waste product has accumulated. So until that waste product has been, waste product has been washed away, the tissue would continue to try to get more blood to it. That causes redness of the skin because the blood vessels dilate. That is called reactive hyperemia. So one way to understand the endothelial function is to restrict the blood supply to a tissue and then release it and then see if the blood vessels are dilating and working correctly, then they will be reactive hyperemia. And they can then see how many red blood cells are coming into that area and what is the velocity of them and so on. So they can measure the blood in, in there. So in this study, what they did was they took 290 patients of post COVID, long COVID symptoms they assessed them on day one of the study and day 21 of the study for reactive hyperemia, or they assessed them for endothelial functional problems. These patients had the symptoms of cardiovascular system health issues, for example, chest pain and palpitations and other such issues. They then gave them sulodexide, this drug. This is actually a drug very interesting that number one, it is like heparin, so it is a blood thinner. It also reduces platelet aggregation, which is also kind of microthrombi busting or blood thinning. But in addition to that, it is anti-inflammatory plus it is corrective for endothelial damage. It is endothelial protective drug. So because of that, they were expecting so the researcher said, and it's a small study, 290 patients divided half and half for sulodexide and for uh, not sulodexide. The researcher said, we wanted to prove the hypothesis that the palpitations and the chest pains may be because of endothelial dysfunction and blood vessel system not working correctly. And to prove that, they gave half of the patient solodexide. And then between from day one to 21, so if you see here, the drug that they gave them was, okay, I'll see the, I think the drug dose is a little bit next. However, what they saw was there was a significant change, improvement in both the chest pain and palpitations at day 21 for those patients who were on solodexide. So that is the basic study. So take away here, anyone who has long COVID or vaccine injury and has chest pains and palpitations, they may consider this drug with their doctor and take this link with, that, with you and share it with your doctor, with your doctor and see if they would consider this. So conclusion, solodexide significantly improves long-lasting post-COVID-19 endothelial dysfunction and alleviates chest pain and palpitations. So it's a very, very interesting one. I want to make sure that I can show you the dose. So yeah, this was the one post-occlusive reactive hyperemia is the test. And here is the dose, 250 LSU, which is liposemic units, approximately equivalent to 25 milligram two times a day during 21 days. So that was the 
Uh, so broken forever says, what is the side effect? Of course, it's a blood thinner. So the side effects are going to be related to blood thinner. But if somebody already has an endothelial dysfunction, then thinning the blood would actually bring it towards normal. So broken forever says, I may try this when I see my doctor, I'll ask. Yes, so please take this uh, uh, study. The link is in the description. Take this link with you. I would go into a detail of the study next week, but the results have really been good. So let me just very quickly show you the results. So if you see here, this is chest pain, area under the curve 0 0.66, P value 0 0.001. So significant, statistically significant result was improvement in chest pain. Similarly, there is improve, improvement in palpitation 0 0.03 is the P value. Then the others, fatigue or shortness of breath, the others do not have statistical significance, so I would not use that. However, the trends in some cases were in the correct side. And of course, chest pain and palpitation is very important. Chest pain and palpitation improvement actually means the whole cardiovascular system improved. That is why the, the palpitations reduced because the blood pressure and blood flow started becoming better. So this is one study that I wanted to put in front of you. Then the next study. So the previous study was long COVID, COVID infection, then long COVID after that. And uh, sometimes I, I find this is uh, as much as I could agree that nowadays, if somebody is vaccine injured, they get lumped together as long COVID because doctors do not pay attention to vaccine injury or insurances are not covering for that. Having said that, it's not necessary that every long COVID is a vaccine injury. Yesterday, when I discussed the uh, female patient who had long COVID since the Wuhan variant, somebody said she must have gotten the vaccine. No, she had long, she had the COVID very early on when the vaccines were not there. And then she developed long COVID and vaccines came way after. So this injury of uh, these post COVID like symptoms can occur with both. And so we have to give this much of the um, flexibility that if somebody has it after the infection, then we should agree and understand and have them find a solution as well. Okay, so this is another study. This is brain dural arteriovenous fistula in the COVID-19 era. It's a very interesting study. The study is this. So let me first show you what do they mean by brain dural arteriovenous fistula. So here, this is a doctor who is a neurosurgeon. I do not have any relationship with them. So their phone number and stuff is here. This is just because I found some written part here that was good. So that's why I brought it here. As a result of this abnormal, I have to show you what is this abnormality. So hold on for a second. Just see the consequences of it. As a result of the abnormal connection between arteries and veins, there are significant changes in blood flow involving the brain. The consequences of these changes vary significantly according to the location of the DAVF, and I'll show you that in a second, and the degree of shunt. At the good end of the spectrum, the patient may only experience pulsatile tinnitus, especially if the abnormal connection is closer to the ear. Once again, I know that I've not shown you the connections and I'm talking about them, so please, uh, bear with me for a second. At the bad end of the spectrum, the patient may eventually suffer from seizures, brain swelling, edema, or stroke. So now let's very quickly look at what we, we are talking about. So in our brain, with our skull are the coverings of the brain, the dura matter. Now the dura matter, imagine that is a Dura matter is, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. So imagine that dura matter is like a plastic, which is applied to the bone, but there is a tiny space between the bone and the plastic. This space is where blood can travel. 
and this is called a sinus because it is bigger it's not artery it's not vein it's a big big structure big hollow cavity we call them sinus and these are dural sinuses so now if i go back here to this diagram again this is neurovascular neurovascularmedicine.com here they are actually showing various levels of the problem and i'm going to first explain the problem using this diagram in this diagram let's go here for number one this little horizontal structure is the sinus so imagine somebody's skull and next to the skull a tiny pocket throughout let's say horizontal there is one in the center and that is a sinus in that sinus or from that sinus there are some veins that are connected which take the blood away from the brain towards back towards the heart usually what happens is and i'm going to very quickly show you this in a diagram as well so usually what happens is that our artery and veins are not directly attached so imagine if this is an artery this is an artery and imagine this is a vein vein veins are thin walled and delicate structures arteries on the other hand are thick walled they have muscles in them they are strong structures they are pulsatile they can handle high pressure veins cannot handle high pressure so what our body has done that the connection between the artery and the vein is not straightforward the connection is that arteries continue to divide into smaller and smaller branches eventually we reach a point where they become microscopically small and we are we call them capillaries then those capillaries eventually go and then start collecting again and they start making veins so this this area the capillary bed as we call it is a very important part physiological part of our body and it helps with lots of functions for example it helps with the regulation of the blood pressure blood flow then it helps with transition from arterial side to the venous side from a high pressure end to the low pressure end then the arterial end of the capillaries allow the nutrition and oxygen and the fluids to get out and the venous end allow the waste products and the carbon dioxide and other things to go back in. So there is a lot that is happening here. The, the capillaries are really small diameter blood vessels and they are one cell thick blood vessels. When the RBCs pass from them, usually the RBCs diameter is bigger than the capillary. For example, RBC is eight to nine uh, nanometer and the uh, micrometer and the capillary is six to seven so what happens is that the the rbc has to kind of uh, flex to get into the capillary and kind of squeeze through it and in that process as they squeeze and and pass through this there is pressure behind them that allows the pressure uh, to cause the nutritions and fluids to squeeze out so this itself is a miracle and it is worth in enjoying and understanding. But the discussion today is that if for some reason an artery becomes directly connected to a vein, then this is called a shunt. Shunts can actually be produced. For example, surgeries can go wrong. I remember when I was studying medicine, one of our surgeons connected femoral artery to femoral vein in the upper leg and the patient died on the table. You connect femoral artery, which is a large artery to femoral vein, blood would simply go from the artery to vein and back to the heart. Heart cannot handle this kind of a load. It, it, the person just had the heart failure on the table, at the table. So this, is, this happens in stab wounds. It can happen with the infection. So let's say there is an infection over here that destroys this arte the capillary bed, creates a cavity here from where the fistula develops. It can happen with the accidents. It can happen with congenital malformations. And it can happen with the pressure effects and so on. This is called an arteriovenous shunt. Now, this shunt can develop in the brain as well. So what happens is in the brain, 
we have the sinus and the sinus is connected with the veins. And then arteries are not supposed to directly be connected here. Arteries would go in and then arteries would divide into smaller capillaries. Then those capillaries would then connect with, with veins. And then finally that fluid, the, <laughs> calling it fluid, the blood goes in this way and finally through here into the sinuses and then back to the heart. However, if there is a problem, there is inflammation of the system or if there is other trauma to the blood vessels, it is possible that these arteries become connected incorrectly to these sinuses. And that is a shunt that has developed. Now, this is a high pressure system artery connected to a low pressure system, a sinus. And it is possible that this artery to the sinus, to this vein and back to the heart. But what happens is that as this shunt develops, the sides, one, the, the sinus itself can become damaged under that high pressure. Number two, as the blood flow dynamics change, this is like if you have a high pressure water channel that is supposed to go through these tiny little channels to another set of channels that collect this water back again and then take that water again. So imagine if these channels break down and they just become one big channel here. So now the blood would start, the water would start flowing from here and very less water would go through these channels because majority is just passing from here. So that is what happens that majority of the blood would just pass from here and here. And now there is stagnation of the flow of the blood in the remaining sinus. And whenever the blood is stagnating, whenever the blood is stopped, that blood would start coagulating and clotting and we'll have thrombus formation. So that is the sinus thrombosis that has occurred. So this is this study. If I go back now to the diagram, this horizontal piece is the sinus. These vertical blue ones are the veins. The red ones are the arteries and they are incorrectly connected with the sinus. This is not normal, this connection. So there are various kinds of connections and these are called cognard, you know, categories one, two, and so on. But important thing is that as you can see, see this red area that is a thrombus. So for example, if there is an abnormality produced that is like this, then blood would come in from the artery and pass through the sinus and this area would start stagnating the blood in here and there is a thrombus. Then there is a thrombus here, there is a thrombus here and here, there is a thrombus here and here. So I think you can understand that as the channel and dynamics of the blood flow change, the area where stagnation would occur will start having thrombosis. Now the study, if I go back to the study now, this study is interesting. What they did was, this is actually from... Um, Spain. So neurosurgery department, hospital, universitario, Rio, Hortige. <laughs> I am just totally destroying it. Valladolid, <laughs> Dolid, Valladolid, Spain. What they said was the following. They said, we, we observed that in our department, we were seeing more these fistulas. So these are the brain Dural, dural is a dura matter, brain dural arteriovenous fistulas. They said we were seeing more of these fistulas. Now, how much more? Seven in 2021. However, what they're saying is that before 2021, a general um, incidence used to be 1.4 to 2 per 100,000. So if I go down here to their data, here, populations, and then the cases of BDAVF and incidence variation from 2011 till 2021. 
So if you see here, start with 2012, 12, they were one. And so the incidence was 0 0.248 per 100,000, then one, which is 0 0.247 per 100,000 and so on. If you see here in 2020, which was the year of infection, there were two, and that was 0 0.492 per 100,000 incidents. And in 2021, there were seven, and that was 1.7 per 100,000. So number one, it's not a very large number. Number two, I want to make sure that you would read authors' limitations and criticism of their own study or this observation, not study a report. But they do say that we want to make sure that you are aware of these reports so we can do bigger studies or be aware of it. So here's what they were showing. They said in 2020, there were two or 0 0.492 per 100,000. In 2021, there were seven, 1.7 per 100,000, so five times more. And if you see here, they say it is seven times more based on the average. They took an average from 2011, this one, to 2020, a year before 21, and that average was 1.4. So it, compared to that average, the change was here almost seven-ish times. So if you see here, this is 0 0.49 to 1.72. Anyways, the question that then became, they called it pre-vaccine time and post-vaccine time. And they said it may be something to do with the vaccines because vaccines are supposed to be causing these clotting as well in some people. And again, this is seven cases. We're not talking thousands of cases. So they wanted to understand, is it something to do with the vaccine? And here is what they found. This is the patient data. In this data, these are the seven cases in 2021. There are two cases who were COVID infected as well. So here, these two. COVID infection, yes. Date of infection, January 19, 21 and November 29, 20. Then they were vaccinated as well. And these are the vaccination dates, April 22, 21, and June 17, 21, and the vaccine types. The remaining five out of seven, the remaining five did not have infection, and they only had the vaccine. So then the researchers say that there is a possibility. Again, it's too tiny a data point. They said there is a possibility that we realize, and we realized first with the adenovirus-based vaccines. Remember Oxford, AstraZeneca, there was a German study that said that there is a possibility of uh, a clotting. There were some women who clotted and died. Some became, um, some developed, uh, you know, injuries. So they said, we know that, that that happens. And then they also said that in messenger RNA time, eventually we also found out that that can also cause endothelial dysfunction and clotting. So the curiosity was, could this be because of vaccines? And they say that at least there are two cases where it was vaccine and infection, but the case um, event was closer to vaccines. So they think it could be because of vaccines. So I wonder, wanted to read some of what they're saying. They're saying, in our case, this is given by the increase in the incidence, which was five times higher during 2021 than the average incidence of the previous nine years. So that's one. Then they say temporarily, sorry, temporality, meaning in time, is demonstrated by the fact that suspected cause precedes the consequence in a reasonable timeline except for two cases that suffered COVID-19 infection prior to the vaccine and to the diagnosis of BDEFE, this dura of cerebrovascular fistulas, the remaining cases received their first dose 90 to 200 days before the diagnosis. If a prothrombotic phenomena is suspected, if there is a possibility of thrombosis occurring, as a potential mechanism for vaccines or COVID to lead 
to the occurrence of BDAVF, again, Dura venous fistulas, it is important to note that it has been reported that the incidence of fistulas significantly increases during the first six months following cerebrovenous thrombosis. So the now this is also an important thing. When you talk with a neurologist, they know this, that the cerebrovenous fistula can give rise to cerebrovenous thrombus. Thrombus is the clotted blood. Or cerebrovenous thrombus can give rise to fistula by damaging that area and accidentally short-circuiting an artery to a vein. So it, they can go both ways. For COVID-19 infection, the time frame in our cohort was 60 to 80 days. Indeed, the time from COVID symptoms to cerebrovenous thrombus reported by other authors is estimated to be between one to two weeks. So they're saying that if there is infection and that causes the CVTs in the brain, then that happens within one to two weeks. However, with the vaccine, it seems like it could be longer. However, before you conclude something, they actually then talk further about it and they say, we are not able to actually see other possibilities. It is curious that in 2021, this incidence increased, but still there could be other reasons. For example, one reason that they thought about was maybe the lockdowns that caused more sedentary behavior, that changed people's lifestyle, that changed people's healthy lifestyle. Maybe that caused an increased propensity to develop thrombi. So they talk about that plausibility, coherence and analogy are discussed together in an attempt to provide a credible explanation supported by or at least without conflicting the available evidence. Accordingly, our rationale is built on the evidence of vaccine causing immune mediated VITTT, VITT, which elevates the risk of CVT, vaccine induced thrombocytopenic thrombosis. So they discuss that. Then here they also discuss more. So, really, what they're doing is that this, these are neurologists. They are looking at this increased number and they're not jumping the gun to say, well, here is a conspiracy for us. They are thinking aloud with us, they're reporting it, and they're saying, hey, we see this, this is abnormal, it needs to be looked into more. So here they're saying, the specificity of the association might be the most controversial item of the current argumentation. The, specific, the specificity, meaning that is it really specific for the vaccine? Is it the vaccine that did it? They said this part of our whole report is controversial. The specificity of the suggested association lies in the evidence of a proven ability of vaccines and ultimately SARS-CoV-2, so both vaccine or SARS-CoV-2, to provoke thrombosis through an immune-mediated pathophysiology. So a neurologist or neurologists are saying, we are seeing that this happens, thrombosis, both by the vaccine and by the infection as well. However, this fact alone might not be enough to state that vaccines or COVID elevate the risk of developing the fistulas. Many other factors that coexist with COVID or vaccine could superstitiously cause, sorry, super, surreptitiously cause CVTs or fistulas by other unknown mechanisms in this specific period of time. For instance, a more sedentary lifestyle due to lockdowns, regimes, or the increment of teleworking could lead to a higher risk of thrombotic phenomena. So they're saying there is this five times increase in 2021. That didn't happen in 2020 where there was just infection. In 2021, there was infection and there is vaccine. In their cases, five had vaccine only and two had vaccine plus infection. But still, this number five is five times higher than the previous numbers. So that is a fact. Now, is it really the vaccine that may be so? 
they think that we think it could be because vaccines do cause thrombosis or is it other lifestyle choices or other ways of our changes? So then they say, consistency would require the repeated observation of this association by various researchers in other centers. So they say that now it will be important that others figure this out as well. They observe this as well. So indeed, the purpose of this warning is precisely to raise awareness in this field to prompt other physicians to report their findings to contest or validate our observations. So it's, they're saying that now that we have raised this alarm, we would like others to either contest it and say, yeah, no, we didn't see it. You guys are just mistaken. It must be something else. Or validate it and say, yes, we are seeing it too. Undoubtedly, vaccines are the best available therapy to prevent the disease. So you know this is a statement that will be there. The incidence of fistulas in the vaccinated population is still very low. If confirmed that this is, the, this is caused by the vaccine, for example, if confirmed, our results would only result in the communication of a very rare complication of vaccination that would not probably change at all the current policies. In this sense, we have tried to temper our assertions and insist on the need for further studies. So why did I discuss this with you? My reason for th this was that it is possible that people would pick it up and start saying that, hey, there is an issue. We should know that what researchers themselves are saying that, hey, we see this with the vaccine. We think it is because of the vaccine. We also see it because of the COVID. However, in the COVID time, 2020, we didn't see this rise. We saw that in 2021 when the other additional thing was vaccine. Then they say, well, there was sedentary lifestyle and there are other factors as well. So they say we are tempering our own assertions. We are not jumping the gun. We are not saying this must be a vaccine. However, we would like others to start looking into it. And then I would request you to read this paragraph for limitations as well. So for me, this is interesting. Why is this interesting as a physician? As a physician, this is interesting for me to understand that, all right, this is one more possibility, both from COVID or the vaccine, seems to be from this report. It's a report. Now what I'm saying is an extrapolation. That means it may be wrong. Now it is my opinion. As a physician, I'm thinking that, all right, so that means vaccine probably caused in some people. These are just seven cases. In some people, it caused their blood vessels to be either become thrombotic that means this thrombus developed first and then there was enough damage that artery and vein and the dura sinuses, they got short-circuited. Or the vaccine caused enough endothelial inflammation and enough of the uh, dynamics and the damage to the blood vessels that they started short-circuiting, which then changed the dynamics of the whole thing, causing the um the thrombi to appear now of course this will be another very important thing to note that what happened to these patients how dangerous was this so what they said was that in in all cases seven cases six of them repaired so what they do is they occlude that channel which has developed they break that channel so they said, we got successful occlusion in six cases. In one case, the occlusion did not happen and they had to re-occlude it, but that was the, uh, the outcome. Now, clinically, how is that relevant? Clinically, that is relevant is because it is possible that if this kind of an issue is happening, then pulsatile tinnitus may happen. There may be headaches. There may be the visual system problems and so on. So there can be such issues that may be related to these vascular changes in the brain. So this was one more that I wanted to make sure that we are looking at it. And I have always been very uh, proud of the cool beans, us over here, that we don't become conspiratorial and we look at both sides of the 
science and try to understand it. We don't close eyes from one side to the other. So this is an interesting uh, story to look at. And here is another uh, article here, Dural Arteriovenous Fistula After Cerebral Venous Thrombosis. So if you see here this article, I put that here in the links to see that it is possible that fistula can develop after thrombosis or thrombosis can cause the fistula. And then last, wanted to share this, that White House COVID response coordinator Ashish Jha to step down. So this is interesting. Did he step down because now there will be accountability or did he step down because the COVID emergency is gone and the COVID department and leadership is really not needed? He's going to go back to Brown University and become the dean of their medical school. And he said, I'm going to do work and whatever. So this is interesting for me as well, that there is th that layer, the executives layers that was handling um, these matters, COVID matters, are now slowly resigning. So this is the discussion. Thank you very much for being here, for spending this time with me for the weekend. Uh, my request to you once again, take advantage of the link for the Dr. Bean's account. Um, we will change it from 67 to 97 next week. We leave it for 97 for some days then we'll retire the 97 as well and just sell the courses. At least that is a plan. I hope you don't become too upset when I sell the courses at higher prices. Every single video you can see has a lot of value and uh, has a right to, to be recognized for its work. So with this, thank you very much. Nice weekend. Like, subscribe and share. There are links in the description if you would like to get access to Dr. Bean or if you would like to just support this work, there are links for that as well. And I would see you on Monday. Bye for now.